Great. Welcome to the Big Apple Film Festival Distribution Summit. I'm your host, Lavender Gill, and I am excited to speak to Sal Scamardo, Vice President of Distribution and Marketing at Film Rise. Sal yes. can take a few minutes and tell us what that means, <laughs> Vice, Mar Vice President <laughs> of Distribution and Marketing. Absolutely. Uh, Film Rise is the world's largest independently owned streaming network. Um, we stream primarily free content uh, on streaming platforms and our own channels around the world. Um, you would see it on free Film Rise free movies and TV. It would be a, a mobile app you could download on your uh, Apple or Google device, Android, uh, in addition to Roku and other platforms, Apple TV, et cetera. We're also a uh, film distributor, um, mostly independent film fare um, for new releases, which I also oversee. Uh, and I oversee the marketing for the entire company and uh, distribution strategies, whether it be a classic TV series, um, library of movies, or a newly acquired independent film or documentary um, that would release usually in a limited way to movie theaters and then to streaming platforms. So, okay. Well, let me take shell. a quick second. So it's a lot going on. Let me take a quick second and tell our attendees, go ahead and submit your questions to the Q&A box, and we'll be sure to get as many of those answered for Sal as we can. Um, so as an independent filmmaker myself, you know, my question is, you know, what kind of stuff does Film Rise look for? Are you looking for TV shows? Are you looking for feature films? You know, and how does that process work? Well, uh, we work, uh, I work across a number of teams in the company uh, for those kinds of things. As far as independent films, we are very uh, select in what we pick up. And it can be a combination of uh, festival fair, you know, films out of Sundance or South by or Tribeca, which we've had some fortune, a uh, good fortune with, uh, or just we are presented with films um, by a lot of the agents like WME, uh, independent uh, submit their films to us. So we really base our acquisitions on, you know, a lot of data and analytics uh, these days in terms of what we're seeing out there as uh, which could be an opportunity. Um, so the, each film you kind of goes through that process and, uh, you know, it could be, uh, but it's usually a mixture of critically acclaimed drama, um, a sprinkling, we're looking at comedies right now because we can all use a good laugh after everything we've been through the last <laughs> few years. Uh, and then we also uh, have had some great fortune with documentaries, um, movies like uh, The State of Texas versus Melissa, which became uh, an international story about a woman who was on death row, a Latina woman on death row in Texas. So we're not afraid to kind of take on the tough subjects. And then we do some... Um, Genre, uh, so we're looking at a horror genre in particular that uh, always does well, and crime always does well for um, the streaming platform. So we'll sprinkle in some of that. So it's a little bit of everything. So uh, I think we're just we're just looking for product that, that really we feel will perform well across platforms. And nowadays we really have to look at what's going to perform uh, on streaming platforms, particularly now on AVOD which is the free streaming platforms, which is driving a lot of the new, uh, it's a big revenue stream that's emerging very rapidly and growing around the world. So we're very much in that space. So, but not every not every independent film uh, will fit that model. So we still do look at films that may end up on a Showtime or HBO Max. Um, Netflix is pretty much out of the indie game unless they directly acquire uh, from a festival on their own. Um, so we're, we're usually in that space, you know, not, not, we're not buying for Netflix. Okay. We'd rather buy for our own channels. Uh, at film <laughs> uh, AVOD is kind of a buzz phrase that's been going on around a lot, especially on these discussions we've had the last couple of days. Yes. Uh, also, I was recently at the American Film Market and that was the whole buzz was AF yes. was uh, AVOD. Can you expand on that? So sure. Well, we were we were a leader in the in the AVOD category with our own uh, OTT. That's a term you'll hear, which is over the top, which is the, our own branded channel. So film rights, free movies and TV. Uh, which you can find on Roku and some other devices. So we've been acquiring and uh, placing content there. Uh, but if that, AVOD has really accelerated in popularity. Uh, well, in large part due to the COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, and also just people looking, you know, I've reached a saturation point with 
subscriptions with Disney and Netflix. There's only so many and we're the free option. So the, it's it's commercial television, basically, for people like me have been around to see almost everything. It's really like the old, old days of television with commercials that's free, but now it's delivered digitally on a mobile device or uh, through an app or something uh, on your television. But but um, certainly there's a, a, a lot of money to be made in AVOD and not everything is uh, fits there because it's free and accessible to everyone. So, you know, you need to, you still have some concern with, you know, kind of adult material or things that might be uh, too niche. So it tends to be more broad streaming series. I think you mentioned television. FilmRise is very much involved in acquiring series for AVOD streaming. It does very well. Um, so uh, whether it's a limited series or uh, a number of seasons, um, we do, we acquire rights specifically for AVOD, and you'll hear this term FAST, uh, which is free ad-supported television. Um, they're curated FAST channels. It's like, I think of it as like Spotify for movies, uh, uh, because you don't have control necessarily over what comes next. It's it's, it's a curated channel that runs like live television, but Ooh. you're going to see a lot of these FAST channels where it may be a single series like Unsolved Mysteries 24-7 um, or you'll store a popular um, shows like Heartland or whatever, where you have a lot of episodes that just runs and runs and runs. And then you'll also see kind of fast movie channels, um, fast comedy. You can slice and dice, but you're going to see a lot of that being tossed around, um, you know, uh, the last, well, certainly it's been talked about in the last year, but going forward, there's a lot of growth in what you call fast so another term, another acronym to, to remember. <laughs> well, there's a lot to process because it seems like yeah. technology is moving very quickly now. It's, it is. It is. Uh, but there's a lot of data that's available that we never had before. So what comes with the technology. So we're able to, to really uh, measure and see what people are interested in and what they're responding to. So there is a lot of experimentation that's happening right now. And I think there'll be a lot of that format will evolve, but it is moving very quickly. I, I agree. Um, but there's a big shift, you know, from traditional linear television. I just came from a, a full day seminar with Advertising Age, and we had uh, representatives from uh, consumer products companies as well as the ad agencies and the platforms, including Netflix, which is now has a commercial TV uh, commercial uh, option, as do all of the others. Um, what what's going to work and what kind of, but there's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot uh, that we're going to see it evolve in the next, as the technology improves, where you may even see films debuting on AVOD or exclusives with certain platforms. They're going to be competing for content because you end up, when, once you build the machine, you got to feed it, right? So, um, and they have very voracious appetites. So that could be a very good thing, I think, for the creative community and those that are looking to um you know get their idea off the ground and and in the pipeline um but certainly like every every kind of um uh, uh generation of technology there's a big explosion and then there's a there's going to be a contraction and consolidation that eventually happens right now we're kind of in the in the wild wild west phase of you know every you know a lot of new services are coming online um but it's always the content stupid that's always my um that's a, that's one thing that never changes over the years as long as I've been doing this is good content will find a home and it's there's lots of different options now for delivery so I can watch the same movie five different ways now um you know and people are making content available however people want to consume it so that's always been film rises model so you want to watch it commercial free you can rent it on Amazon or Apple TV you don't mind commercials you'll see it on Pluto or Tubi um, or you might see it in a theater in a dark room full of strangers. So just however you feel like, you know, it works for you. All right. We have a question for you. It's just to clarify, yeah. Netflix no longer requires because they're producing their own content. Will FilmRise one day consider producing their own content? We are producing our own content now. We're kind of dipping our toe, uh, you know, in originals. So we are doing, right now we're doing a co-production deal. So we will partner with perhaps a uh, uh, another entity uh, could be uh, a global deal where uh, we carve out US or North American rights uh, and jointly 
uh, we'll finance uh, a part of the, a new series, for example. But we haven't, uh, we are, we do invest in movies, but generally it's rare uh, for us to kind of get in on like a script level. Um, we're looking at finished films primarily. So there's not a lot of originals for us there, but it's not out of the question in the future for us to do that. Um, I think for the right project, if the numbers are there, we'll, we'll make, make that investment, excuse me. Um, but it's, I, we are making investments in specific genres of original content, uh, primarily crime, uh, documentary format, um, not so much scripted. It's mostly unscripted content, um, uh, some reality, uh, we do have a lot of, of licensed content in that genre that does really well. So we've invested in shows like Bloodline Detectives, which is a forensics uh, science-based uh, series hosted by Nancy Grace, which has done really well on its third season. Um, we do have um, a number of probably six or eight other series that are in some phase of, of development or production that's going to come online in 2023. So that's a new area for us. And it's certainly something that uh, we need to do. Um, uh, you know, because you want to have control and ownership and uh, of uh, of those series for long periods of time. No, absolutely. You yeah. know, you said it was the wild, wild west, and and with that comes a lot of opportunity. So yes. For these independent producers that are attending this uh, panel today, what is your advice to them? How do you how do you take advantage of this situation right now? Well, I think, you know, be involved in the community, obviously, uh, in the creative community. And I, I know there's lots of entry points um, that uh, something can come to us. I mean, relationships with production companies, like I mentioned, we we do uh, partner with, with production companies that often will bring uh, a series to us for consideration, uh, where they may have the rights, the story rights to um, obviously festivals are an important entry point for and on, on the indie film side so getting into those festivals, you know, um, and getting noticed, certainly uh, agents are important to us we like dealing with, you know, the CAAs and WMEs of the world that bring us content. Uh, all the time, uh, uh, you know, it, it may be again various stages of uh, some movies may have no festival uh, exposure at all and we'll take that on. Uh, or because we love the concept, but we have a movie right now called uh, A Christmas Karen, which is uh, opening on Friday, which uh, had zero to no uh, awareness, but it was produced uh, for a reasonable amount of money. And we felt it was a strong concept that could work for the holidays and a very funny comedy, um, which was a category that we wanted to grow. So that that's, came to us really through, uh, through an agent um, that said, gee, we think this, you guys can could do a really good job with this and you know so so there's there's a lot of opportunity i think uh, but you need to work with the right people because the direct pitch is usually you know the hardest to get through um just because you know someone at film rise doesn't mean your project's you know going to get any attention generally uh you know through lawyers agents attorneys or production companies is how we we vet a lot of uh, a lot of the content. Not to say that we won't get a referral from someone uh, saying they you should check this out. We'll take a look at it. So you know, a screener is always helpful. A link, a uh, trailer. But if it's too early stage, we're probably not uh, going to look at it. You know, it, it, we we really prefer something that's at least somewhat baked <laughs> on that on that side. Is there anything in particular companies like FilmRise are looking for? Well, I think, you know, uh, you know, you need to look at kind of what's popular. I mean, you can always kind of create a buzz, um, but I think there's never a never uh, less, I think, on the dramas. Um, it's the festival stuff is a little bit of a tough sell right now, unless you have some good cast and great, you're expecting terrific reviews. Um, so that I think there's always an appetite for, but it's not a, uh, it's not going to move the needle from a revenue standpoint necessarily. But it does give you a nice uh, kind of credibility on and and film rise. We love, love having those sprinkling of those projects, um, and because we, we want to stay in the game and and have those films like Driveways uh, was a sleeper that we picked up the spirit award kind of nominee the the sundance festival we're not in bidding war territory so we're not going to start bidding against uh hulu and 
and other entities for a product, but we we will track movies and um, see where they are. And if we really like like a particular story, we'll invest in it and reach out. Documentaries are are uh, always a good subject for us. And I think we tend to lean on either strong issue documentary um, that have big strong communities associated. So um, we look at kind of what the trends are, what people are focusing on. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, crime is always uh, those kind of um, interesting twists on maybe real situations, like I mentioned, uh, where there's where there's a rallying cry, uh, a cause or something associated with it, we feel we can get traction in the news, um, on, in the press. For State of Texas versus Melissa was a really good example of that. We stuck with that movie for two years working it. We never gave up, um, always looking for opportunities. And finally, the, the case really got the attention of influencers and um, folks like the Innocence Project and organizations. Um, we're not afraid to kind of roll up our sleeves if we really love a picture and believe in the cause. Um, and then I think, but we're moving towards, again, I think this is influenced by AVOD and what's been happening with the streaming channels, you know, uh, uh, Warner Discovery, you know, they've all kind of, you know, are reorganizing these giant media companies and looking with from within for their content because they need to monetize what they already have. So that's that um, those opportunities are kind of for at least for now are not available to us necessarily for some of the more mainstream pictures, but we do look to Avon and thankfully we control our own destiny so we can monetize content without without anyone else necessarily involved, but we do like to, to place it. But I think the in the documentary space, you know, uh, you know, in the, we've certainly seen a lot of activity with um, diversity, um, whether it's indigenous peoples, storylines around that. Again, uh, there are some great filmmakers out there that are really doing some great investigative uh, work uh, and uncovering a lot of things regarding corruption or um, you know the human condition that we 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 look at. Um, in addition to um, lighter stuff with a little bit more humor, um, we'll take a look at that as well. Just, you know, it just, uh, there's no kind of one thing over the other necessarily. And I like to have a mix in the release schedule so that it's not just the same thing all the time. So we're able to kind of change gears and, and do uh, one minute we could be doing a movie about veterans uh, with a movie like MVP. And then the next we're doing a Christmas Karen a week later. So we can, we're very well in that, in that distribution and marketing, which you have to be. So I, I hope that answers your question. It wasn't too rambling. Uh, yeah, it was sorry. great. That was a, that's a broad Thank spectrum you. that you guys are looking for. Uh, it seems like years yeah. ago, you know, distributors were very specific in what they wanted. We only do this genre or we only do this type of film, but now it seems right. like the floodgates have opened. Yeah, well, for Film Rise, I think, you know, our brand is, you know, we have a large audience that, you know, that could ranges from kind of middle America that's streaming the free, you know, uh, classic TV Westerns and, and all of that. People know us that way, or they also know us for independent films that they might see in our house theater, um, you know, that they, they may know us that way. Those are all kind of points of entry into our world, but we're not defined as a brand like an A24 might be, or, you know, some of that are known for specific types of content. Um, but we're just not in, we're not that, you know, we're not, we don't want to box ourselves in that way. Mm -hmm. So I think our, our strength is really that we have the ability to tackle just about any subject and create the market for it or find the market for it. And no two films are really alike. So, but we do, obviously we're seeing what's happening in the news and what's on social media and what we feel uh, people are interested in. Uh, for example, on the original sides that you mentioned originals, we've uh, um, moved into the creator's market and the, what's called digital native. You have these uh, creators now that have built huge audiences on YouTube, for example, mm -hmm. um, whether it's, kind of, you know, young, you know, uh, young, younger fair with kind of comedy, uh, or it could be more how to, but these uh, or nature, uh, there's all different categories uh, within the originals. 
And these people are stars all onto themselves. There's actually an award show that it's called the Streamies that, that recognizes these creators, could be in the cooking category. And they all live in that YouTube space with tens of millions of followers and subscribers. And we're, um, we've come up with a way for those people to now monetize um, there are audiences on streaming platforms. So basically moving from the short form YouTube content to a longer form streaming half hour format or hour format, um, you know, stitching together uh, and curating what they've did, what they've done and built on YouTube. So that's an interesting, uh, and it's actually been uh, quite successful for us and, um, and we're being more aggressive in that space. Um, and because, you know, those, those are the stars out there that, uh, you know, have the social uh, footprint um, that we can leverage. So if someone's of, suddenly, if their programming is suddenly available on Pluto or YouTube, or I'm sorry, Pluto or Tubi as a free uh, half hour format, we're finding that the audience will shift over there and we'll also have new audiences that may discover these digital native creators um, that aren't on YouTube, but still have an audience. So that's been an interesting, um, uh, and we're the first to really do that. Um, and we've got about a dozen or so um, really successful creators um, in that space of uh, Preston and Brianna. There's some real names in there. Uh, Brave Wilderness, which is a terrific kind of, uh, if, if you remember, anyone remembers like the old Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom. Yeah. It's kind of, uh, that's like on steroids for today. Uh, with a very colorful host that's, uh, you know, out uh, in the jungles and uh, taping these really great segments that, that have performed really well on streaming platforms. So that's another area of original programming that didn't exist 10 years ago or five years ago, really, as an opportunity. So yeah, we're, we have our fingers in a lot of different things. Um, but look, I mean, our reach is global and, you know, uh, Again, uh, international is a, is a, is an expansion uh, important market. So we're also looking at content that might be specific to countries. Um, so if you're in Europe, uh, you know we we have channel relationships now in 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 Italy, in Germany, in Spain that might only be Spanish language or may only be in the native language that we're acquiring rights for or looking to develop a series for. Um, again, for primarily for the free channels, but also for linear, which is still a business and SPOD still a thriving business in, in parts of the world. So the US is way ahead in the in the ad space. Um, and everyone else is kind of catching up. So to that, but eventually they will. So there's 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 a lot of motivation for us to kind of be have our fingers in a lot of different things. Okay. Well I think you already answered a big chunk of this following question. Oh. Uh, do you consider social media follower support when it comes to your acquisitions? Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, our data analytics people are scrubbing the, you know, they're scrubbing the internet. They're looking at, you know, everything from IMDB to social media, what uh, cast, um, I, you know, it's, it, it's important. I live and breathe this every day with, um, I'll give an example. We have a film MVP, which is merging vets and players. It's about veterans. Uh, it was no accident that we, uh, released it on Veterans Day uh, to, 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 uh, to TVOD. Um, we, we do lean very heavily on um, with the social media potential when we look at a film. So, okay, it's produced by Sylvester Stallone. There's an audience there, obviously, that follows his films. The cast, um, the people that surround it, and also, um, you know, everything that kind of touches a particular subject. In this case, you have veterans, so there's lots of organizations that will we feel that we can target on social to um, support the film and and get the conversation going. So social media is a is is a currency that we want to leverage as much as possible. And um, um, so those those types of movies kind of lend themselves. They all come with some level of social nowadays. It's rare that you you don't have a cast member or two that has a uh, a significant following of uh, even directors it just depends on how active they are on social media some older celebrities and older cast they may not have much at all but perhaps the director or and we even we even lean on the festivals that a film is played in 
and we'll go back to Tribeca Film Festival if it if it won won at Tribeca, and and most people are happy to post. Those are all really terrific uh, ways to kind of get the word out about a film. It's very important. So social media is extremely important now, um, and it has been for a while it, to the success of of any release. And um, and it's something that we focus on a great deal. Of course, you can always buy your way into all of that. Um, our strategies tend, tends to be more organic, although we do some paid advertising as well um, with trailers and Instagram and all of those, Facebook. Um, so we will spend money um, to get the word out, but um, there's nothing like a great post by a, a star that has you know eight or 10 million followers. It just, it, can it light up a movie? Just one, two, three, you know? So um, that there's, there's always, uh, and, and in the acquisition right from the beginning, all the way through the release, we we look at social media. Okay. Um, so we had, we had somebody who asked a question yesterday that I'm going to ask you today. Um, they okay. Already, they've already shot a pilot for a show. Okay. You know, they've written the rest of the season. Is that something that would appeal to a company like Film Rise, or is that a negative? Sure. No, it's not a negative. I think having a pilot, you know, uh, do you know if it's reality or scripted? Did Did you say uh, they They didn't give any details. Oh, okay. That. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but I think having uh, having a, a pilot is a good idea, um, you know, and, and to get it in front of uh, an, our acquisitions team uh, for a look is is always a, is good as a good thing uh, and to look at the episodes. And if you have a, a short presentation deck that outlines uh, the the uh, the story arc and, and the episodes, uh, whatever the seasons and potential, that is something that we like to see. Um, if there's any cast uh, attached, obviously we'll take a look or you know, a director or filmmaker that might've done other things, or it could be first time. We have a lot of first time filmmakers in our library. I think every movie we released last year uh, was, a, was a first time filmmaker and a lot of women, uh, female filmmakers, uh, it's their, it was their directorial debut. So um, we're, we don't shy away from, from that at all. So it just needs to be a strong concept that we think um, will work. And then also, can they execute? Is there, you know, is, is there something in place where the, you know, the show can be produced in a quality way? Sure. So we're not a production company. We don't have editing rooms. And, you know, uh, we, like I said, we'll partner with producers to make that happen. But we're not, we're not actually... Uh, you know, out shooting like a movie studio. Yeah. Right. Now, when a first time filmmaker comes to you with a film, and this is a loaded yeah. question, so if you can't answer it, I understand, <laughs> you know, do you guys give minimum guarantees? Like, how does the revenue sharing work? Like, what's the, what's the process uh, there for, so for, for someone I on can, this side? Uh, well, you know, if we love the film, um, we're going to love the filmmaker, uh, you know, and obviously the, the those filmmakers are out doing, lots of things and hopefully there may be some recognition um you know uh, with some of the festivals and i know there's a lot of great first-time filmmaker programs and funding sources so we we look at those we've had a number of those movies uh that have come through like tribeca and others that have that uh, where we discover a lot of these new filmmakers um and yes yeah, so if we do uh, make an offer it the range is wide it just depends on where we feel the film is going to perform, but uh, generally there is a MG um, uh, in most cases, I would say uh, a, a minimum guarantee, and then some type of a back end revenue a split and a distribution fee um, that's taken uh, in, in a typical acquisition. So yeah. money up, some money up front, um, a fee, and then a, and then an incentive on a back end split. Is is a pretty common, I think, typical form uh, uh, formula for most film acquisition uh, in the market. So we're we're very competitive with what other distributors are uh, structurally offering. I think the difference, uh, while film right, some of the MGs may, may not seem like a lot, um, certainly not enough to cover the production of a film in most cases. Um, you really want to look at the marketing team and the distribution um, that the that whatever distributor uh, is offering you. And our edge at FilmRise has really been, I pride this because I had the 
department, but that we are we are very hands on marketing. We're not just throwing stuff out uh, into the world and seeing what happens. There are a lot of distributors that will will just pick up a title and just throw it into the into the mix and really not give it any attention mm -hmm. or any uh, dedicated uh, launch. Um, so as a filmmaker, I think it's important to kind of um, meet with the marketing team. I always jump on a call before we. Um, either when the offer's made or right before, just so that the filmmakers have a chance to, to, um, to talk with us about what we might do with their film. And, um, and that used to makes a big difference for filmmakers in my opinion. So um, they might, they might've had a sexier offer from someone else, but once they meet us and talk to us and, and see if we have an idea exchange, they feel that they might be, have a better home um, with us. So, um, so marketing, the marketing uh, strategy and distribution strategy can be really important uh, for some filmmakers, uh, in addition to the being a, a deal that, you know, that works. Okay. So, but we want filmmakers to make money, we want them to recoup and, um, and get into overages as soon as possible. Um, so, but I think for Film Rise, you know, we know we can monetize your film, um, because we control a lot of, of the channels. Um, and we have the really strong relationships and a good sales team. So those are all things that I think it's important. I'm a filmmaker. Also, I have a film uh, with Magnolia, a documentary that I, I produced. I don't know what it's been now, five or seven years ago. <laughs> Can't even remember. Um, you know, that uh, and those were all really important things to, to me when we signed the deal to what are you doing to, to market the film and and, uh, and not just during for release. Uh, Generally, those deals go for 15 to 20 years. A licensing deal can go that long. So how are you continuing to promote the movie? You know, so, you know, my film dealt with rock and roll and glam and, and a photographer who just passed away a year ago, sadly, uh, who was David Bowie's photographer, Mick Rock. Uh, and, um, you know, he before he passed away, he delivered his last uh, coffee table book to Simon & Schuster. That book is now releasing uh, a, a year after his death, and there's going to be a lot of attention and fanfare around it. And that's an opportunity for Magnolia to re-promote uh, and position the film that uh, features that artist. And so, uh, um, you know, you want you want a distributor that's going to think like that and isn't just going to leave it in the catalog. They're going to, you know, surface that film again and maybe do some special marketing to monetize it even more. So I think those those are things that a good distributor will always be doing, you know, figuring out ways to, to uh, you know, again, social media kind of makes it it makes it not as easy, but if you have a good uh, uh, promotions team, they're always you're always looking at the library and figuring out ways to highlight films. And for example, another example is a movie we have called My Friend Dahmer. Um, and there's been obviously with the new series from Ryan Murphy, a tremendous amount of interest in, 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 in there's always a lot of interest in Jeffrey Dahmer, which is a little creepy, but, um, but that film, you know, we put it from, we obviously put it front and center and um, because people are talking about Jeffrey Dahmer and, and the series. So people want to see that film. So um, we will, you know, highlight it, promote it, resurface it, tweet about it post post things about it and tie it into that Netflix uh, uh, series so that people know it's there. So that's what a good distributor will do. All right, we got another question for you. Do you have any marketing advice for someone self-producing a project and making it available in a less known streaming platform? Oh, wow. Um, well, you know, I think kind of what I've been saying is a lot of good advice I've been giving. And if you're gonna do it yourself, I mean, I think, uh, you know, having a good social media, uh, a, a place to point people to, and if you're in a limited uh, uh, limited number of platforms, you're going to be doing a lot of the marketing. But if you can, uh, again, not knowing the subject and not kind of knowing what the opportunities are, but I would lean very heavily on publicity um, and getting, you know, making sure people know about the film. Um, I don't know if there's any festivals or, or I would definitely try to use the festival circuit as a way to get awareness for the film. A lot of time, you know, that those are great audiences that can do a lot of word of mouth um, for you. So festivals are always great 
uh, strategy for that. And then of course, you know, making sure that people can find you on social media and making sure you link as much as possible to that platform to convert uh, into a click or a download to rent or to own or whatever uh, to stream, whatever the that platform is uh, promoting. Um, Dan, if you have a good relationship with the platform, I don't know if it's like a DIY situation, but if that platform does have uh, some curation or marketing folks, um, develop a good relationship with them and um, and see to try to come up with ways to uh, leverage the cast or leverage the subject in a way that will benefit them and and get them to uh, to do uh, uh, you know some of the outreach as well. There are a lot of tools available, you know, direct response. Um, uh, you know, whether it's emails or just, you know, uh, target audience and advertising spends, Facebook allows you to target, they all allow you to, you know, kind of ways to reach audiences um, based on the interests or other groups that they belong to. So, you know, those tools are available to anyone, but you need to just kind of, you know, have a, have a strategy um, you know, try to try to focus your energy, um, work towards a, a specific date. Timing, again, case in point with MVP, timing is everything, depending on the film. So if there is a logical kind of point where you where people are going to be talking about a specific, there's the obvious holidays and all of that you know, romance, you know, Valentine's Day. But if, the, you know, look at the calendar and see what's out there. If there's a, if you have a film that's uh, on uh, dealing with mental illness, for example, there are awareness months and months where organizations are focused on that, um, where you can tap into maybe what's already happening, which will elevate your film. There's a lot of different strategies like that, that, that I would, would suggest uh, for someone that's doing something on their own. You know, really, really get, to know the community, as much community that you can wrangle, because um, you know if you don't, especially if you don't have a lot of money to spend. All right, uh, you've talked about uh, film festivals, yes, and you've named a few, but it seems like there's film festivals every weekend now, <laughs> uh, on every only, corner and every block. Yes, are there only certain festivals you go to, or does any film festival win? Uh, you know, something that would catch your guys' eye. Well, I think, you know, certainly there are kind of the the, the really well-known festivals that we're going to want to, you know, that that have uh, the credibility and the awareness, ability to generate awareness for a film that, that consumers do respond to. So certainly for independent, you know, that would be, you know, obviously Sundance, South by Tribeca, um, but there are lots of festivals um they don't always necessarily necessarily have to be the top tier it can be second tier festivals depending on the subject i mean um you know certainly uh there's you know we've we've looked at stuff through out of nashville or woodstock um you know that that uh you know the hamptons there are festivals that are kind of more kind of um where where you're you're looking at to buy and and uh, that and there are others that are more awareness generating festivals, but they all matter. I mean, we love um, a lot of times we'll pick up a film that, you know, maybe it's only appeared in, in six or eight festivals and we'll be able to book another 20, you know, because there, there are a lot of great festivals. You know, if it's LGBTQ uh, theme, there are a lot of uh, terrific festivals that just focus on on that genre. New Fest, you know, uh, uh, you name it, the new uh, uh, Provincetown, you know, we know where they are. So you can really target festivals and make it work for you and build an, and build a uh, a lot of awareness for a film uh, and con and get the conversation started there. And, and it can also be a revenue stream. Some festivals will license um, depending on the film. I've, so we've certainly had that happen where they may, may pay for your director or star to appear in a Q&A. Um, obviously the pandemic kind of put a, a little bit of a kibosh on that, but the festivals have come back. Um, you know, they've got good sponsorship relationships, things like that. And they're looking for movies that audiences, they feel their audiences are going to react to and, and support. I mean, there's festivals for equestrian. We've had movies about horses, dogs, you name it. There's a festival for it, but uh, we don't shy away. We're not snobby when it comes to the festivals. If it works for the movie, we'll book it. 
you know, uh, or we'll take a look at it. Okay. So again, it's, it's about community. It's about, uh, you know, kind of curating the audience, um, you know, and again, that that's important in terms of, um, you know, um, getting people to tune in. Okay. Uh, I have multiple questions that basically are all the same question here. And yes. I want to ask that to you. Is there uh, a place where people with finished films, finished documentaries uh, can submit to Film Rise for uh, possible uh, distribution? Uh, I mean, I, uh, you know, I hesitate to kind of, uh, I mean, yes, I think you can definitely reach out to us if you have a relationship. I mean, it's always about relationships, but, um, you know, we have a decent acquisitions team that's kind of out there all the time. But again, I, we tend tend to rely mostly on uh, kind of pre vetted content. So, you know, we do have filmmakers who submit, and uh, again, um, you know, we prefer to deal with their agents. So, mm -hmm. I would highly recommend getting a sales rep or an agent um, that has a relationship with one of our folks on the acquisitions team. That's right. not to say that you couldn't approach uh, someone. That, uh, we are at the festivals. We do go. There's usually a film rise person at Toronto or say, you know, uh, AFM. We were just at AFM. I mean, we are there at the market. So you can simply come up to us and talk to us that way, um, where we are, we have kind of boots on the ground. So, um, and, and any other kind of referral or anything that um, comes our way is good. Um, you know, I hesitate because I'm always on the receiving end of folks with projects and they don't necessarily understand the process sometimes and why maybe something isn't picked up and it becomes really personal and it's really not personal. Um, people acquire, companies acquire movies that make sense for them. It doesn't mean the movie's good or bad, necessarily bad. Um, it just isn't going to fit. Um, you know, it might not be something that we're looking at. It might be perfectly wonderful, but uh, it's hard to say no. And, and sometimes they don't want to hear it. And it just becomes kind of a, you know, that's why we kind of prefer that things are vetted a little bit so that the agents know what we're looking for. They're talking to us all the time and they're not going to send us product that doesn't make sense right. uh, at the moment. So that's really the reason why for that. Um, so there needs to be a little bit of a vetting process, I think, for us, if you're going to get a positive response. Okay. But we do have a guy who is dedicated, has a, is a dedicated indie film uh, director of acquisitions, uh, Gabe, uh, Gabriel Gazul, and he's very well known and, uh, used to work at Showtime. And, you know, if you follow the trades, you're going to know who those people are. Uh, you can certainly Google film rise acquisitions and you'll get a bunch of names. So, you know, I, I don't want to discourage anyone from reaching out. I think you just need to be realistic about if you don't get an answer or if the answer isn't what you want to hear. <laughs> it's, no, no, no. it's, it's, again, it's not always a reflection on the, on the quality or the, uh, production itself it's just we're not looking for that right now no that's i mean that's how the industry works with gatekeepers yeah. you know what exactly. i mean so, yeah. yeah i totally understand that but it is amazing uh, sometimes how much filmmakers aren't aren't aware of that uh you know and 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 how the mechanics work it, it's important for filmmakers to really understand what's going on in the market and to to be knowledgeable i think about the platforms and and what's going on and, and, and it, well, it saves a lot of time <laughs> it definitely uh, does yeah, you know yeah. i i like i said i went to afm this year and it opened my eyes in a significant way because you know i'm a screenwriter and a director and you don't think in terms of outside the creative but the creative right of movie is like a third of the process you know there's this whole other that's side right. you know right. pre-production yeah. side and uh, they don't teach a lot of that in film schools so that's something that filmmakers they don't to figure and out it's, imp it's important when you're doing your budgets for your films to you know budget for publicity and to budget for what happens when the film is completed that you're only just beginning the film is done now what you're only you're really only halfway there there's a long journey that has to happen after that you need to be prepared for and you need to be shooting and thinking about the what tools you can provide that distributive make it an attractive film so you know getting behind the scenes you know or uh, uh making sure you have good photography and uh you know shooting images you know while you're in production so that you can you know hand it off to the art and you'd be amazed at, at how 
those things aren't taken care of and it just makes our job harder. So, um, so you need to think beyond the production, uh, you know, and, and where the film is going to land and also be open to new ways of distribution, you know, a Christmas Karen, which is coming out, uh, you know, didn't have a theatrical run. Uh, we were very straight about feeling that it wasn't really a place, you know, that it was, it was going to be a tough sell to book. Um, it, we felt that it was, it had a bigger audience on the streaming platforms and, um, but we did do some limited um, bookings for it and limited festivals just to get some awareness out for it. But it's primarily a video straight to video. The film producers have, have done other films and they were very understanding. They knew what was going on out there and they saw that that's the right strategy for the film. So it's not always the same. You know, I know directors love to see their movies on the big screen. Mm -hmm you know, there's a, there's a certain kind of um, satisfaction to that, but it, not all movies are going to end up there. Uh, not to say that it wouldn't maybe in a, in a lesser way or in a more targeted way might not be a full theatrical run, but there may be a lot of in, smaller bookings or what weekends or one-offs that could happen for your film where you do get that sitting in the dark in a theater experience that a lot of directors really want. So I think you just need as a creator or as be to be open um, to discussing everything because we live in a new world now. Um, you know, the pandemic absolutely shifted people's behavior away from uh, movies. And let's face it, it's expensive uh, for a lot of, a lot of, you know, for that experience. Um, and, and people are just accustomed to, to streaming it at home. Now, you know, we like to, we like to push films out, uh, like I said, you know, so that you have options on, on how to do it, but primarily it's a streaming experience now. So that's, that's really what's driving, uh, if you want to make money anyway, uh, on your picture. <laughs> it's not, you know, some filmmakers are doing it, they, they have an investor that wanted, you know, it's a, it's a passion project and they don't care, good for the filmmaker, you're not on, you're not on the hook. You right. can, it alleviates that pressure, but most people would like to see a return. <laughs> so. well, so, well, Sal, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, enlightening conversation. Really grateful for your time. Oh, I went this we went really quick. We're out of time. Yes, thank you, you for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, I hope this was helpful to, uh, to everybody uh, listening and watching today. Um, I can't speak for everyone else, but I really enjoyed it. We just got to thank you from one of our attendees and we really appreciate it. All right, okay. we hope Hope to hear from you soon. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. All Take right. care. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody.